Welcome to the 33rd year, the fourth program of the 33rd year. And I want to thank the Hist Historical Society very much. Doug, are you still up there? But Doug and Chris have done a great job of making this transition from Fort Snelling here um, workable. And uh, we're, we're still, still going through some uh, uh, fitting of the shoes here, but it's working out well. How many Harold Deutsch students are in the audience? Raise your hand. Come on, Connie, raise your hand. <laughs> a few, well, I know all of us are proud of being students of Harold. Uh, there's also a round tablet back there, pick that up. And um, again, I, I want to recognize veterans. Would the World War II veterans please stand? Ed, if you could stand. I know that Bob Johnson's here. Uh, we're, we're always looking for we're always looking for veterans. Thank you, guys. As you know, November is dedicated as the Dr. Harold Deutsch lecture. And I, I want to introduce uh, Elizabeth. Uh, Harold's widow is, is down in the audience with us. Uh, we're, we're glad you're here this evening. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, to, to introduce uh, the program this evening and introduce our speaker, Dr. Connie Harris, who is on our board, is giving me some relief. And uh, Connie, if you'd come forward. Connie was a student of Harold. At, uh, she was a student of uh, Joe Fitz Harris at one time at St. Uh, Thomas. She was then a student of Harold Deutsch and ended up getting her PhD from Nebraska. So a uh, great part of our board. Connie, I'm going to turn it over to you, dear. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, as most of you know, uh, tonight is the Dr. Harold C. Deutsch Lecture. And we often hear about topics uh, relating to his research and his life. Over the years, we've had speakers like Doug Waller discussing Wild Bill Donovan, who was the head of the Office of Strategic Services. And later, Doug Waller came back and discussed Donovan's disciples, those men who worked for Donovan and in each in turn became head of the CIA. Then there also was David Kahn who talked about code breaking um, in World War II. The late Ken Heckler um, was here twice with us uh, presenting on his interrogations at uh, Mondorf Luxembourg. And some of his interrogations also found their way into Harold Deutsch's works. Peter Hoffman spoke here on the conspiracy against Hitler, and Michael Basler um, also on the forgotten trials of the Holocaust. Now, while Professor Stoller did not um, study with Dr. Deutsch, their paths did cross at history conferences, and they both dealt with the intersection of military and diplomatic history, which I'm sure Professor Stoller will be mentioning this evening. Professor Stoller has stated that if I try to say everything, even on his brief biography, that we'll be here all night. Um, so here's the abbreviation of the abbreviation. Um, he is the Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Vermont, where he taught from 1970 to 2007. He received his BA from the City College of New York and his MA and PhD from that school just down the road that we don't like to talk about, the University of Wisconsin. Sorry, go Gophers. <laughs> Get the ax back, keep the ax, there we go. Two weeks. Huh? Two weeks, Two weeks. yeah. <laughs> the work that is on sale uh, in the lobby, the Allies and Adversaries, won the Distinguished Book Award for the Society of Military History. His more recent books we've actually presented here, uh, Allies in War, Britain and America Against the Axis Powers, The Papers of George Marshall, he helped with uh, volumes six and seven with uh, Larry Bland and Dan Daniel Holt. This volume six also won the Link Cool Prize for documentary editing from the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations. 
and also of the United States in World War II, a documentary history uh, he wrote, edited with uh, Molly Michael Bohr. And he also has numerous articles and chapters, each dealing with US diplomatic and military history. He is, has also been the visiting professor at the US Naval War College, the US Military Academy at West Point, the US Military In History Institute, and Wash and right now, I believe you're still at Washington and Lee, um, 2010. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he is also the past president uh, for the Society uh, for Historians of American Foreign Relations, an organization I've been part of in the past, and also on the board of trustees for the Society of Military History. So, needless to say, uh, Professor Stoller, Stoller has had a very distinguished career. Um, he even is good friends with my advisor down at Nebraska, Lloyd Ambrosius. Um, and from visiting with him over the past couple of days, he is a true gentleman and a scholar. So I introduce Professor Mark Stoller. I would like to thank the Roundtable and um, uh, this great honor, as far as I am concerned, of giving the Harold Deutsch Lecture. Now, during World War II, the story goes, the United States abandoned its traditional policy of isolationism and fought with allies. First time they had fought with allies since the Revolutionary War. Um, but I don't like, uh, instead of the word isolationism, you know, it's a great comment, if you look at the expansion of the United States across the continent, and then overseas, you know, the crack has to come to you. Boy, those isolationists sure do get around. Uh, I think more appropriate is the term unilateralist. The United States did not want to be bound to allies. It did not want to get sucked into wars by allies. And it stayed away even in World War I, as Connie has pointed out in her introduction to the latest newsletter, the United States was not an allied power, it was an associated power. Um, uh, this is the first formal alliance since the, the uh, one with France. Now it's formed in late 1940, early 1942, and it is dominated by its three most powerful members. The alliance in World War II is dominated by its three most powerful members, the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. And it is one of the most successful alliances in modern history. In a period of four years, it achieves its stated goal of the total military defeat of all the Axis powers. Germany, Italy, the Japanese, obtains their unconditional surrender, and then it militarily occupies and remakes them. Now, the alliance did so despite enormous differences and serious conflicts between its members. Differences and conflicts that could have easily wrecked the coalition. In Winston Churchill's words, the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without them. Now, the alliance collapsed as soon as the war ended as a result of the inability of the big three to agree on a desired post-war order. That fact and the resulting lengthy Cold War has tended to blind people to the alliance's enormous success as a military coalition during World, World War II. It shouldn't. The alliance succeeded in what it was set up to do. And I am going to talk tonight on the differences and conflicts that the Allies had, primarily in the sphere of military strategy, but not totally in that sphere, and how they overcame those differences during the war. Winston Churchill put it very nicely in terms of the impossibility of separating military from political uh, issues. It is not possible, he wrote, in a major war to divide military from political affairs. At the summit, they are one. How was this alliance formed? It is officially formed and announced on January 1st, 1942, in the Declaration of the United Nations. 
26 countries then at war with any or all of the Axis powers pledged to employ their full resources against the nations with whom they were then at war, to cooperate with each other, not to sign a separate peace, to subscribe to the principles that had been enunciated by Churchill and Roosevelt four months earlier in their first meeting and the Atlantic Charter. There they are meeting off the coast of uh, Newfoundland in August of 1941 and producing the Atlantic Charter, the statement of war aims in World War II. The alliance is open to new members who went to war with any of the Axis powers and eventually 45 nations will sign on. It also gives its name to the post-war international organization that its members would create in 1944, the United Nations. The organization was originally, that name is the Alliance, and the original members were members of the Alliance. Now, the declaration had actually been preceded not only by the Atlantic Charter, but a few other important things. The Anglo-Soviet Alliance of July 12, 1941, whereby the two nations pledged to assist each other and not to make a separate peace. The American decision earlier in 1941 to provide free war material via Lend-Lease, first to Great Britain and then to the Soviet Union and other nations fighting Nazi Germany. And third, a secret Anglo-American military agreement, uh, ABC-1, whereby if the United States and Great Britain found themselves at war with all three Axis powers, they agreed they would defeat, concentrate on defeating Germany first. Where did that idea come from? That you would, you know, um, ironically, it originates in, and let me go to this now, in the 1920s and 30s, each country in war planning in the United States had a color. Japan was orange, okay? Um, Britain was red, and yes, there was a war plan against Great Britain. And Britain had been allied with Japan from 1902 to about 1922. So you had to come up with a plan, what if we go to war against red and orange? the red-orange war plan, and a decision that early, we will concentrate on defeating Britain first. The more powerful enemy, the one more of a threat to us, multiple reasons for doing this. Uh, and it's one of the basic points of the Grand Alliance. Now, Pearl Harbor is a godsend for Churchill. And I'd like to quote to you, the, the day, day he receives word of Pearl Harbor is the same day he receives word of a Soviet counter-offensive in front of Moscow against the Germans. So the Soviet Union is not going to fold. This is what Churchill wrote. So we had won after all. United, we could subdue everybody else in the world. Saturated and satiated with emotion and sensation, I went to bed and slept the sleep of the saved and the thankful. That's, that's Winston Churchill writing, obviously. Um, but the day after Pearl Harbor, it's clear Churchill is afraid the United States, as a result of Pearl Harbor, may abandon the agreement to concentrate on Germany first. So Churchill decides to go to Washington where Roosevelt will put him up as a guest at the White House. And it will provide an opportunity, not only for the Declaration of the United Nations and a reaffirmation of Germany first, but also to the establishment of what Churchill will label the, quote, special relationship between the two nations during the war, especially in the military realm. Um, what do we have here? The establishment of a principle that sounds very simple, unity of command. But what that meant was that in every theater of war, all British, 
British Commonwealth and U.S. ground, naval, and air forces were to be under a single commander. That is a cooperation, I think, that's unprecedented in military history. You also establish, at this time, the combined chiefs of staff. There they are, the British chiefs of staff and the American chiefs of staff in a combined organization to run the global war effort and report directly to Churchill and to FDR. Um, it's composed of the Army, Navy, and Air Chiefs of Britain and the United States, and also a representative of the President and a representative of the Prime Minister are part of the group. This group meets in person whenever Roosevelt and Churchill meet, and they will meet 10 times during the war. At all other times, they meet in Washington with the British chiefs represented by members of the British Joint Staff Mission in Washington and headed by the former uh, British Army Chief Sir John Dill, Field Marshal Sir John Dill. Interesting sidelight, this will lead to the creation of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The Joint Chiefs of Staff did not exist before this. And the Joint Chiefs are set up to mirror the British Chiefs of Staff organization so as to be able to meet them. They don't have a charter. They wanted one. Roosevelt said, why? You report to me. You don't need a charter. After the war, people thought differently about it. Um, but the war, and the war is not limited to this Anglo-American special relationship. And here's a little chart I put together years ago, okay? You have got the combined chiefs of staff. They are going to divide the world into theaters in which they operate. The Americans in charge of the Pacific, the British will be in charge of the Middle East, Mediterranean, Indian Ocean, and eventually Southeast Asia and the Atlantic European theater will be shared. But you also have the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin and China under Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, those are separate theaters of war. This guy, some of you may have heard of Joseph Stilwell. This poor guy uh, is sent to be chief of staff to Zhang as part of the war effort. He reports to Jean Kai-shek, to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, to the Combined Chiefs of Staff, and to Franklin Roosevelt. The joke was the only one who Stilwell did not report to was God. Um, China is in there for reasons I will explain in just a moment. The alliance, as I said, is dominated by the big three. And the basis of their alliance is agreement on two fundamental points. Germany is to be totally defeated first. The Soviet Union is not even at war with the Japanese until 1945. That's first. Second, they agree that they want to create a new world order in which a third world war could never happen. My quip in class, that's a lot to agree on. All they disagree on is how to accomplish either of these goals. Okay. Let me turn to a map, a color map of Europe, okay? Britain first. Britain wants an indirect peripheral military strategy, in Churchill's words, to close the ring around Germany. And that will mean strategic bombing of Germany, blockade, and get control of French North Africa and the Mediterranean and hopefully knock Italy out of the war. The idea is Germany surrounded will, be for, will, will, will collapse from this pressure. Once that is achieved, the British would like to recreate the world that existed before the rise of Hitler and the Nazis. The Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin disagrees on both points. Strategically, the Soviets attack British strategy and demand instead an Anglo-American cross-channel invasion of northern France in order to establish a, quote, second front 
the Eastern Front being the first front, a second front that will relieve the pressure on the hard-pressed Red Armies in the East and force Germany into a two-front war. For the post-war world, Stalin argues that the pre-existing world order is what led to the rise of Nazi Germany and its Axis partners in the first place. Instead, he calls for a permanent weakening of Germany, perhaps the dismemberment of Germany, so it cannot start a third world war, and the division of Europe into Eastern and Western spheres of influence. The Soviet Union would control the Eastern sphere. Part of that would be to retain, and this map is, it does not show it, part of that would be to retain the territorial gains Stalin had under the 1939 Nazi-Soviet pact. The Baltic states, Eastern Poland, portions of Romania. By the way, most of this had been part of the czarist Russian Empire before World War I. And uh, Stalin's demand for this, many see as showing his link to the czarist um, history in this regard. The rest of Eastern Europe, he wants, quote, friendly governments in Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe. Uh, he also wants these 1939 boundaries recognized by his allies by formal treaty. Okay, what about the United States here? The United States agrees with Stalin from a strategic point of view on crossing the channel as quickly as possible, but disagrees with him and with, as well as Churchill on the post-war world army. Strategy first, the US Army rates British strategy as indecisive and lengthy and calls instead for cross-channel operations as soon as possible. The aim, keep Russia in the war, force Germany into a two-front war, obtain total victory, and, then, and that will in turn enable the United States to focus on the Japanese. As for the treaty that Stalin demands, Roosevelt and the Amer uh, State Department are adamantly opposed to any territorial treaties during the war for fear it will weaken the alliance, not strengthen it, and that it will weaken public support for the war. What they are thinking about here is what word of the secret territorial treaties did to public opinion in World War I. So no treaties. What is the post-war world to look like? Roosevelt wants an end to European colonial empires in Asia and Africa, the replacement of Japan with China as the great power in Asia, and a new world order based upon the Atlantic Charter, a new international organization to replace the League of Nations, and a world run by what Roosevelt calls the four policemen, the victorious powers, Britain, the United States, Russia, and he includes China, since he intends to make China the great power of the Far East. Now, where did these disagreements come from? They reflect the unique histories and experiences of each of the three. The peripheral strategy of Great Britain is a traditional sea power strategy, as well as one forced on Britain in 1940 by the fall of France. Also, that tradition was violated by the British in World War I, and the result was the decimation of an entire British generation. Furthermore, Churchill in World War I to break that bloody trench deadlock had favored a peripheral strategy, most notably the Gallipoli campaign, which was Churchill's idea, and let's put it mildly, it didn't work. The Soviet Union is a land power with a traditional direct land power strategy, and one facing the most serious threat to its existence, and in fact the existence of Russia as a country since the Napoleonic invasion of 1812. This one is actually worse. Hitler sends three million Axis forces across the border in June of 1941, the greatest invasion in history. And Soviet losses in land, resources, and men are unbelievable. The United States suffered approximately 294,000 combat dead during the world, world, world War II, the second highest figure for any war in 
U.S. history, topped only by the Civil War. Okay? The Soviets had more dead in the single battle of Stalingrad. The total American and British dead total in the war is a little under 900,000. The total Soviet dead is now estimated at 25 to 27 million. 97% of all German combat deaths before D-Day are on the Eastern Front. It is a bloodbath of unprecedented proportions. And the Stalin needs immediate and direct relief via that second front. Also, the highly suspicious Stalin, I mean, that's an understatement. Let's call the paranoid Stalin, wants an allied commitment in blood to preclude the possibility that Britain and the United States will simply sit back and allow Germany and Russia to bleed each other to death. And from his point of view, that is exactly what they did until the overlord invasion in 1944. And what about the United States? The United States is a sea power and a land power, and one with strategic options due to its detached position from the major battlefields. Now, as I previously mentioned, it had decided to concentrate on defeating Germany first. Um, you had ABC1, you had the US Rainbow Plan 5. Um, so you've got this. But from its own history, the army favor has favored a direct strategy since the days of Ulysses Grant. It considers the direct strategy more decisive. Use your land power to defeat the enemy army in the field rather than count on a peripheral campaign to weaken it to the point of a total collapse. Also, the direct approach is necessary to keep Russia in the war and to first force Germany into an unwinnable two-front war. The direct approach is also, from the American point of view, quicker than the British approach, and speed is essential because both the public and the U.S. Navy are preoccupied with the Japanese and want revenge for, um, for Pearl Harbor. Secretary of War Henry Stimson will tell Winston Churchill in 1943 that the American people have accepted the Germany first strategy only by an intellectual effort. Their real enemy, whom they, want to, whom they hate, are the Japanese who had attacked them on December 7th, 1941. Um, there's one other thing I would like to point out. It's seldom pointed out. This is a map, of the standard Mercator projection of the world that the United States used at that point. It's the one I grew up with, uh, and many of you did, okay? This is the British view of the world. Looks a bit different, doesn't it? Okay? Um, and in a sense, the tyranny of a map or the ability of a map to get you to think in different ways. Um, I find that fascinating. Okay. Next. 1942 is marked by devastating Allied military defeats in all theaters. And it, this is the point at which it looks like the Axis can win. Everywhere. Germany uh, still invading the Soviet Union and controlling all of Europe. Um, in the Far East, Japan runs wild. This is, by the way, the largest empire the world has ever seen. Now, admittedly, there's a lot of water in it, but there are also a lot of people in it and resources, okay? Um, and there's absolutely no power to stop the Japanese. Uh, also, German successes in North Africa, everywhere. In the midst of these defeats, the American Joint Chiefs of Staff proposed in March and April of 1942 to concentrate forces in Great Britain for a massive cross-channel attack in 1943 and a much smaller one in 1942 if Russia is on the verge of collapse. 
There are three code names used here. Bolero is the code name for the buildup in, the, in Great Britain. Roundup is the 1943 massive cross-channel attack. And Sledgehammer is the 1942 operation with whatever forces are then available. The estimate is five to 10 divisions. Roundup would have 48. This plan is put together by General Marshall's War Plans Division, which in March is renamed the Operations Division, and is under the command of a relatively unknown one-star general named Dwight David Eisenhower. Great irony, it is Eisenhower and his staff who write the plan that he will then lead. Um, Roosevelt agrees with this plan. Why? Get the public focused on Europe over the Pacific and get Stalin to drop his demand for a formal treaty to carve up Europe. Uh, instead, Roosevelt offers Stalin a second front in 1942. Okay? Uh, Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov visits uh, both London and Washington to get a, quote, second front promise. It's not really a promise, but it is, but it is close. The British at first are forced to agree because they fear if they don't, the Americans will turn to the Pacific. But in light of the continued defeats in 1942, by July they reject any cross-channel crossing that year and call instead for an Anglo-American invasion of French North Africa which is controlled by the Vichy French government, which is officially neutral, but actually collaborationist with Germany. And this is codenamed Operation Gymnast. The Joint Chiefs are vehemently opposed to this. They say it will not help the Russians at all, and consequently Russia will collapse due to lack of any aid, and it will so disperse Anglo-American forces as to preclude Roundup in 1943. And what the Joint Chiefs want to do is threaten the British with a turn to the Pacific against the Japanese. Roosevelt forcefully vetoes it, and he signs his veto, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Commander-in-Chief, just in case they didn't get the message. He refers to this as a red herring and taking up your dishes and going home and he will not tolerate it. And he forces them to go to London and agree to the gymnast operation, the invasion of French North Africa, if the British will not cross the channel in 1942. Why? I mean, this is a split in the US ranks as well as the Anglo-American ranks. Why? Roosevelt insists we must show the Russians something in 1942, and you need to show the public a successful offensive in the European theater in order to halt the pressure for a move against the Japanese. Marshall will later say that one of the lessons that he learned in World War II was that in a democracy, you must have a successful offensive every year. And then he sardonically said, People need to be entertained. And then he backed away from that and said, no, that, you know, that's a bit strong, but you get the point. The Joint Chiefs are thus forced to agree to gymnast in July of 1942. It is renamed Operation Torch with, with Marshall's protege, Dwight Eisenhower, to command it. But the Americans insist in return on a statement that launching torch instead of sledgehammer renders roundup, quote, impracticable of successful execution and means that with the exception of air operations, the Allies had, quote, definitely accepted a defensive encircling line of action for the continental European theater. And in line with such reasoning, the Joint Chiefs in July of 1940, uh, August really, of July and August of 1942, Sanction the first, yeah, this map does show it. Sanction the invasion of Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands, to, which the Japanese had already occupied. Throw them out, prevent the Japanese from cutting the lines of communication to 
Australia. So despite the Germany first strategy, the first American offensive action in the war is in the Solomons against the Japanese. Churchill, after getting agreement to gymnast, flies to Moscow to personally tell Stalin the news, which he says was like, quote, carrying a lump of ice to the North, North Pole. You can imagine Stalin's reaction. And Churchill, to swill, it is at this point that Churchill uh, sketches a crocodile and says, in addition to attacking the hard snout, northern France, we should attack the soft underbelly of the crocodile. <laughs> Marshall would later comment that the soft underbelly had chrome steel baseboards. Um, Stalin accuses Great Britain and the United States of bad faith, but he has no choice but to accept what has happened. Churchill flies home saying, I've told him the worst. He hadn't. He hadn't told him that from the American Joint Chiefs point of view, Roundup is out of the question for 1943. Churchill thinks they can wrap the thing up in a couple of weeks. So does Roosevelt. They will be proven wrong. Now, what is going to follow in the fall of 1942 are a series of lengthy, epic battles. It's Stalingrad in Russia, El Alamein against Rum Rommel in Egypt, Operation Torch in French North Africa, and Guadalcanal in the South, uh, excuse me, the South Pacific. All of which the Allies eventually win, <clears throat> excuse me, and all of which, which led to profound consequences for the war as a whole. Now, these Allied victories are normally viewed, and all of you have heard it, this is, quote, the great turning point of the war. Well, that's true, but it's false. After these battles, the Axis powers can no longer achieve total victory. But that does not doom them to total defeat. Take a look at what they occupy at this time. They are in control of enormous resources and population, and the war could end in a negotiated peace by which they would keep their conquests. In order to defeat the Axis, the Allies are going to need a coordinated global strategy, something quite difficult to achieve in light of what we've already seen and the unconnected nature of the individual victories in 1942. The question becomes, where next in Europe? And in January of 1943, in January of 1943, Churchill and Roosevelt meet in the recently captured city of Casablanca in French North Africa to decide. By that point, Hitler has decided to hold North Africa by sending German forces into Tunisia. And that is what's going to make the campaign go on until May of 1943. Well, where do we go next? The British say the obvious thing is let's knock Italy out of the war. Let's invade Sicily and force the Italians out. Uh, Roosevelt's aide, Harry Hopkins, will refer to, is this all you're going to do? That's rather feeble, as he put it. There are two German divisions that you're going to be facing. Um, is this all you are going to do? What the Casablanca Conference is famous for, however, is Hitler's, Hitler's, listen to me, Roosevelt's statement that Allied policy shall be unconditional surrender. He announces this at a press conference. There are myths galore largely spread by Winston Churchill, okay, who said, I was totally surprised when I heard this. It was not a surprise. First of all, unconditional surrender is the lowest common denominator holding the alliance together, and it had been, it had been discussed before the conference in both London and Washington. The actual timing at that press conference is the only thing that was new. Why did Roosevelt announce it now? To reassure the Russians and the Chinese in light of the fact that so little was planned to help them in 1943, and to reassure the public in light of the fact that Eisenhower, in order to get 
the French forces in North Africa to lay down their arms had agreed on a deal with the Vichy commander, Admiral Jean Dar Darlan, and there was an uproar against this in both Britain and the US. What are we doing dealing with a Nazi collaborator, a French Nazi collaborator? What are we gonna do next? Deal with Goebbels or Goering rather than Hitler? And this is Roosevelt's way of saying no. This was done simply as a military move at that time. Well, the summer of 1943, Sicily will be successfully invaded. Mussolini will be overthrown. The Italians will sue for peace. And the Germans, in the greatest tank battle in history, will destroy Russian armor at the Battle of Kursk. Uh, and from that point on, the Germans are on the defensive on the Eastern Front. Um, but Stalin is now told that you are not going to get a second front in 1943, and he explodes in anger. He will recall his ambassadors from London and Washington, and separate peace rumors will fill the air. Was there any reality to this? There were feelers at a very low level through Sweden in the spring of 1943. They went nowhere. Um, and we don't know, was Stalin seriously doing this, or was he just putting that out there to scare his allies into action? We will never know. But um, relations with Russia are at a low point in the summer of 1943. But with the overthrow of M Mussolini, the surrender of Italy, and reassurance from the combined chiefs of staff, Roosevelt and Churchill, we will definitely cross the channel in 1944. New operation, now codenamed Overlord. Stalin agrees to a meeting of the foreign ministers in Moscow and to be followed by a meeting of the big three themselves in Tehran in late November. On the agenda for the Russians at the Foreign Ministers Conference is one item, Overlord. Are you really going to do it this time? We want reassurance. And they get it. But then Churchill changes his mind. And he presses for a six week delay in Overlord in order to take the island of Rhodes in the Aegean did this stop working? Rob, I think it did. Sorry, it's my cat's toy. There it is. There, it's your cat's toy? Can you get your cat over here to make it work again? Um, to take that island of Rhodes and other Aegean islands from the surrendering Italians before the Germans do and thereby bring Turkey into the war as part of that closing the ring strategy. Uh, Churchill asked for a preliminary meeting with Roosevelt in Cairo before Tehran to discuss this. Roosevelt and the Joint Chiefs are vehemently opposed to any delay in Overlord. And Roosevelt has to agree to meet with Churchill in Cairo, but then he invites Jean Kai-shek to come along too thereby making sure that the meeting will be dominated by Far Eastern affairs rather than uh, European affairs. To make matters worse, at this conference, Churchill will promise Jean Kai-shek an amphibious operation in the Bay of Bengal, Operation Buccaneer, um, which will use scarce landing craft, landing craft of the key bottleneck, there are not enough landing craft for all the things you want to do. And he refuses even to discuss Churchill's Aegean proposal before the meeting with Stalin. Tehran thus becomes the crucial meeting of the war. Most of you learned that Yalta was the crucial meeting of the war. Uh-uh. Tehran was. And there are the three of them in Tehran in November of 1943. When presented with the choice of immediate action in the Aegean and Italy versus overlord on time, 
Stalin emphatically chooses overlord on time. When Churchill says, well, what about the army in Italy? After we take Rome, where are we supposed to go? And Stalin says, you've told me you have a plan to invade southern France. That's where those forces should go. Uh, Operation Anvil. Um, Stalin says, if you do this, if you do Overlord and Anvil, in return, I promise a major Soviet offensive at the same time as Overlord and entry into the war against Japan once Germany has been beaten. In effect, a quid pro quo. You give me my second front, I'll give you the second front that you want. Churchill is simply outvoted, and he is humiliated as Roosevelt and, Chir and Stalin both pick on him and in insult him. Churchill commented later that it was at Tehran that he realized for the first time what a small nation Britain was. There I sat, on one side of me, the great Russian bear, paws outstretched, and on the other side, the great American buffalo. And in between was me, the poor little English donkey, who was the only one who knew the right way home. <laughs> now, what's going on here? How did this happen? Churchill had been virtually running Anglo-American strategy until this point. Britain is reaching its mobilization peak by the end of 1943, whereas the United States and the Soviet Union have not. They have greater resources, greater manpower. The future is going to belong to them. Stalin will ask Roosevelt, who is going to command o Overlord? And Roosevelt will say, I haven't made up my mind yet. And Stalin says, and nothing will come of this, dismisses it. Roosevelt realizes he has to make a choice. Everyone had thought it would be Marshall who would command it. But now he's being told by other members of the Joint Chiefs as well as others, Marshall is running the American global war effort. You're going to take him away from that to run a theater? Uh, it may be the most important military command in US history, but he can't be spared. Roosevelt asks Marshall, do you want the command? Ro Marshall being Marshall says, I won't answer that. You have to do what's best for the country, not what is best for George Marshall. At which point Roosevelt says, then it shall be Eisenhower. I could not sleep at night with you out of the country. You ever wonder what went through, I've wondered what went through Marshall's head, denied the greatest military command in US history and given the highest compliment an American army officer can possibly get. I could not sleep at night with you out of the country. Now, far from coincidentally, in light of this grand strategic bargain at Tehran, 1944 is the year of stupendous allied victories in every theater except China. In Europe, Rome is taken, Overlord succeeds, Anvil succeeds, France is liberated. On the Eastern Front, it is the year of the 10 great Soviet victories the Germans are thrown completely out of the Soviet Union, and the Red Army is now advancing into Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe. In the Pacific, similarly, you have great victories. The Battle of the Philippine Sea, which destroys Japanese naval air power, and the Battle of Lady Gulf, the largest naval battle in history, which destroys the bulk of the Japanese surface fleet. You invade Saipan in the Marianas, thereby breaking the inner ring of Japanese defenses, and you, take the, you invade the Philippines, thereby cutting the Japanese off from the resources of Southeast Asia. These are the, what you see here are the Allied territorial gains of 1944. They're ex ex extraordinary, really. Germany is doomed now if the Allies stay together. Um, by the way, the Allies by this point have also defeated the U-boat threat and have finally succeeded in making the bombing campaign work. The key was to find fighter aircraft superior to the Germans and fighter aircraft that had the range to accompany the bombers over Germany. And the aim now shifts to the destruction of the German fighter force. 
Um, but despite all of these gains, strategic conflicts can continue. T Churchill now presses, instead of invade southern France, take the forces from Italy and cross the Adriatic Sea and go through a gap in the mountains all the way up to Vienna. Uh, this is where Marshall made the comment about the soft underbelly having chrome steel baseboards. It's, it is a fantasy. Uh, it cannot work given the terrain. In the second half of the year, Churchill and his chiefs object vehemently to Eisenhower's broad front strategy in Western Europe and his, Eisenhower's decision to command the ever-expanding ground armies himself rather than leave them in the hands of Montgomery. Montgomery's command is now limited primarily to British and Canadian forces in the north. Montgomery favors a single thrust from the north into Germany. Eisenhower insists on a broad front strategy whereby all British, Canadian, American, and French forces will advance simultaneously into Germany. In both cases, Churchill lost the debate, thereby further illustrating the declining power of Great Britain within the alliance. Meanwhile, I said the one theater in which there is not allied victory is China. The Japanese launch a major offensive which almost knocks China out of the war. And what that does is make Russian intervention in the war of the Far East even more important. The Chinese had been tying down the bulk of the Japanese army. The United States never faced the bulk of the Japanese army in the Pacific. The Chinese had them tied down with China collapsing. You want the Russians to now do it. There is also conflict with China, with the Soviet Union, over Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe. As the Red Army um, invades Poland and makes clear it is going to control it. At this point, the Joint Chiefs will produce two very interesting papers that predict that at the end of the war, there will be, as they put it, a change in the world balance of power unprecedented since the fall of Rome. The future will show a serious decline in British power that the United, and the United States and Soviet Union will emerge as the two superpowers with neither one capable of defeating the other, even if allied with Great Britain. This plus the continued centrality of the Soviet war effort to victory in Europe and the need for it in the war against the Japanese lead the Joint Chiefs to warn against getting involved with the British in any East European controversies with the Russians. Defeated on the strategic level, Churchill flies to Moscow to reach a deal with Stalin on Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe. I don't have the time to quote from it, it is fascinating. Stalin and Churchill carved up, divided Eastern Europe one night, uh, and it's in Churchill's memoirs. Britain was to control Greece, Stalin was to control Romania, 50-50 uh, in Yugoslavia, 70-30 in Hungary. Um, it is fascinating, to put it mildly, and Churchill had written it down on a piece of paper that was then passed to Stalin, who put a big blue pencil tick mark on it, and then it pushed it into the center of the table, at which point there was a long silence, Churchill said, and I said, might it not be thought rather cynical if it seemed we had disposed of these issues so faithful to millions of people in such an offhand manner, let's burn the paper. Stalin responded, no, you keep it. We are coming onto the Cold War. What this shows Roosevelt is that he can no longer avoid discussing post-war territorial issues. And that will in turn lead to the notorious Yalta Conference. Now you saw the picture of Roosevelt at Tehran. Okay? This is the picture of Roosevelt 
just a year and a few months later. He's dying. There is no question about it. And in the 1950s, Yalta is perceived as the great giveaway by a, by a naive and dying Franklin Roosevelt. The only thing true in that statement is that Roosevelt was dying. There was no naivete here. Roosevelt got what he wanted at the Yalta conference. Soviet agreement to American terms for the United Nations and an actual date for Soviet entry into the war against the Japanese. The British got what they wanted. The Russians got what they wanted. Um, appeasement has become a dirty word, but allies appease each other. That's the way alliances work. And it's not a dirty word. It's one of the basic principles of human behavior. When was the last time you appeased a member of your family or a member of your family appeased you? Uh, it was the worst policy possible in the 1930s, but that doesn't mean you make it into a dirty word. So now I've challenged you with two issues, appeasement and isolationism. Um, I'm not going to go any further. I'm not going to go into the end of the war against the Japanese. Roosevelt will die uh, in April. This will be followed by Hitler's suicide and the unconditional surrender of Germany in May. So what conclusions can we reach from this? The Grand Alliance succeeded for numerous reasons. The first and most important was the fact that military defeat could be avoided and victory achieved only if the coalition worked. Second, the three leaders realized this, and they were therefore willing to compromise both their military strategies and their post-war desires in order to obtain total victory. Of equal importance was the maintaining of the special Anglo-American alliance within the Grand Alliance. And that is, that's a lecture unto itself. Now, the successful negotiation of differences among the three powers did not continue after the defeat of the Axis powers. It's interesting, all three wanted the alliance to continue after the war, but each one wanted it to continue on his own terms. And with the defeat of their enemies, there was no longer a pressing need to compromise in order to keep the coalition together. Consequently, the Grand Alliance shared the fate of all other wartime alliances dissolution after either victory or defeat. But that in no way lessens the extraordinary success of the alliance during World War II. Finally, the success of the alliance coming coupled with the ensuing Cold War with the Soviet Union led the United States to help form and join other alliances after 1945 rather than return to its unilateral policies. Most notably, NATO, but also the Rio Pact, the Southeast Asia Treaty or Organization, and indirectly, CENTO. The United States became the centerpiece of a multilateral world order that has lasted now more than 70 years. Whether it will continue to last, I would say, is now an open question. And I leave you with that. Thank you very much. What? With the anointing of uh, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, was there not a lot of conflict going on between Mao and Chiang in China at that time? And did we just, or did FDR presume that Chiang was going to be the uh, surviving ruler of China? Okay, yes. Um, the, it's, it, it is another topic and a huge one. But the civil war between Mao and Zhang was officially suspended when Japan invaded China. But unofficially, it never stopped. Uh, but um, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin all assumed that Chiang Kai-shek was going to win. Uh, Stalin at Yalta agreed to recognize Chiang Kai-shek's government and to negotiate with it on certain issues. Um, uh, no one except Mao and uh, certain 
China experts who went in and saw what was going on expected Mao to win. But that is, as you said, totally another lecture. Was there any uh, contact with the Russian uh, army chiefs, our, our, their chiefs of staff, uh, on a constant basis between these big meetings? Uh, were, were they asked to come to Washington and have their people there too, or, or was that kind of held away? It's a very interesting question. Did you all hear it? Uh, uh, what about the Russians? Uh, were they ever invited to join in this Anglo-American special military re relationship? Um, uh, the Americans were interested in trying it. The British were not. Um, they said you would have language uh, issues. It would simply not work if you tried to make it global in that way, and that you were better off letting the Soviets go on their own, helping them with uh, military supplies, with military operations, but go their own way. <clears throat> the world's a big place, and to try to coordinate a global war effort, uh, which is what Marshall was doing. Um, famous story told, that Frank Capra told, the filmmaker, Capra wound up making the Why We Fight series, um, which was shown to American s soldiers as well as the American public, why are we in this war? And Capra said that Marshall called him in and asked him to do this, and Capra said, General, I'm a commercial filmmaker. I've never made a documentary film in my life. At which point Marshall said, Capra, I've never run a global war in my life. There are boys out there getting their legs shot off, and they have, they, they have never, and it, Capra snapped to attention and said, yes, sir, I'm going to make you the best film series you have ever seen. Uh, um, it, it was just too, too much. Um, it's a great what if question. What if the Soviets had been invited into this? How would it have operated? You had, for failure, the Allied Supreme War Council in World War I, which did not work until the very end. Um, and that was a lesson they all had in mind to avoid. Um, uh, so Stalin is kept out of it, but of course, the, when Stalin meets with Roosevelt and Churchill, he brings his staff with him, and they meet with the British and American chiefs, both at Tehran and at Yalta, and again after Roosevelt's death at Potsdam. They will meet together to plan strategy. And by the way, another myth, Yalta was not a peace conference. There never was a peace conference that ended World War II because of the Cold War. Yalta is a military conference with political overtones as the war is reaching its end. But uh, the combined chiefs and the Russians are planning where their armies are going to go, how they're going to help each, each other, and how they're going to avoid a collision whereby Anglo-American and Russian forces going full speed clash. Your casualties would have been enormous if that had happened. And at Yalta and later, you start making some dividing lines. So there is collaboration, but never the close collaboration that you had between Britain and the United States. So what was the sentiment like with the U.S. allying themselves with the Soviet Union? Because I'm very familiar with, you know, the Red Scare and also the Russian Revolution. Yes. How do you think that, how do you think the U.S. Uh, population dealt with having an alliance with, say, the Soviet Union? It's a very good question, and there has been a lot written about it, okay? Uh, the United, relations between the United States and the Soviet Union, to say they had been terrible before 1941 would be an understatement. Uh, the United States and Britain both intervened in the Russian Civil War in an effort to overthrow uh, the uh, Lenin's government. Uh, that failed. Um, the United States refused to recognize the Soviet Union until 1933, and then the Nazi-Soviet pact totally poisoned relations. So what changes things? I think once again, Churchill stated it perfectly. On the day that Hitler invaded 
Russia. Churchill told his personal secretary that he was going to make a speech on the floor of commons welcoming the Russians as an ally. And uh, uh, the secretary said, Prime Minister, you are the most famous anti-communist in the world. Uh, um, you talked during World War I about strangling the baby in the crib via military intervention. Uh, why the change of heart? Churchill put it very bluntly. If Hitler invaded hell, I would at least make a favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. <laughs> it's as simple and straightforward as that. The enemy of my primary enemy is my friend. It's the basic principle of international relations. The Americans and the British accepted this and had great hopes for cooperation after the war. You had had the first great Red Scare after World, World War I, but here are our Soviet allies and look at what they're doing to the Germans and how critical they are and perhaps by working together during the war, we can work together after the war. Um, so the, the public accepted this. Uh, there was, uh, but as issues arose, the public swung to the other extreme quite quickly. Um, it took about two to three years for the shift to take place. But then we get into a lecture on the origins of the Cold War, and if you want to stay here till midnight, I'll be happy to do that. Well, I, I, I want to give a little uh, uh, prelogue here. The January program, I think, will answer a lot of the programs if, if you look at the uh, program we have in January. Tom. Uh, how did Market Garden fit into the broad front strategy? Ah, uh, great questions, audience. I, I, how did Market Garden, the bridge too far, fit into the broad front strategy? Eisenhower was willing to give Montgomery one shot at the single thrust. That was Market Garden. Uh, after Montgomery failed in that operation, Eisenhower said, that's it. We are going to advance all along the line and we're going to have a broad front strategy. Uh, the British would not ac accept it, but they were simply overruled by American power on, on this. But Market Garden was the one time Eisenhower said, OK, you think you can do this? Try it. Uh, why Market Garden failed, again, is a, is, a, is a whole other matter. My own opinion is Montgomery was the master of the set piece battle a la World War I. He was not someone who would move rapidly, uh, and he wanted to make sure every chess piece was in place. That was not what you needed at Market Garden. Uh, tea. The, the British stopped for tea, but it, it, there was that, there was, and the, the, there was more. The idea of sending those paratroopers in to take those three bridges and then expecting that armored column to go up one road, the only road available, it was an insane plan to begin with. It was a huge gamble, and it failed. I uh, wanted to address one of the potential uh, strains in the special relationship, the colonial issue. Uh, Roosevelt was strongly anti-colonial, and uh, at least OSS operatives in Asia were actually uh, trying to undermine colonial yes. regimes, especially in French Indochina. Yes. How did they, how did they deal with that in the uh, Grand Alliance? Again, an excellent question. In 1942, I think it was at the Arcadia Conference, Roosevelt raised the issue of independence for India, and Churchill exploded. And from that point on, Roosevelt said, I'm not going to raise it with him again. That doesn't mean I have changed my mind on this at all. Uh, but I'm just, you cannot raise this issue with Winston. He is an avowed um, imperialist, defender of the British Empire. When he announces the great victory at El Alamein, which is really the first British military victory in the war, in his speech to Commons, he, he, he adds, 
uh, that he has not become his majesty's first minister to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. So this is a direct collision. What happens in 1944-45 is that uh, as part, I said there was a lot of appeasement at Yalta. Roosevelt appeases Churchill by backing off on what will become uh, a trusteeship of the UN. Originally, it was to be all the European colonies. Uh, and Churchill said, over my dead body, am I going to accept that? So instead, it becomes conquered enemy territory and any areas voluntarily put into trusteeship by the European colonial powers. You can guess at how many did that. Uh, Roosevelt said again and again that French Indochina was the worst example of colonialism in the world. And basically, that over his dead body would France get it back. That is what happened, although Roosevelt himself relented to an extent in 1945, again to keep the alliance together. The compromises that had to be made in order for the coalition to, to continue until victory had been achieved. Neither man changed his mind during the war. You mentioned at the beginning that there were 45 nations yes. allied. You never hear squat about most of them. <laughs> what happened? What happened? Okay, first of all, um, originally there were 26. Uh, and then if you wanted, by 45, the allies are making clear that if you want to be an original member of this new international or organization, you have got to make war on at least one of the Axis powers. Turkey, Churchill had been pressing Turkey to come into the war for years, and the Turkish leader, who had hearing problems, became particularly deaf whenever Churchill raised that issue. <laughs> Yet, I think it's, it's either March or April of 45 that Turkey declares war on Germany in order to join the international organization. Uh, who are the nations that really contribute troops uh, and force? The French do. Clearly, the French do. Um, uh, the Poles do. Um, I'm, I'm sorry? Brazil did. And the Commonwealth countries. Canada. There are five beaches at Normandy. Okay? Everyone thinks it's the... Three of them are occupied by the British and the Canadians. Two by the Americans. Uh, that's one of those pieces of history we tend to for, forget. Um, the na th there were token con contributions by most nations, but you are right. The Brazilians had more than a token going in. Can you tell them the Pikrete story? <laughs> Isaac loves the Pikrete story. I pointed out that the British and American chiefs, when they met, almost came to blows in their arguments, okay? At the first Quebec conference, where they finally settle on Overlord with a date, there are huge arguments. And at one point, this had happened previously in Washington in May of 1943, what the combined chiefs decide is kick everybody out of the room except the eight of us, so that we can really let our hair down and see if we can settle it. And so it both the Washington Conference and the Quebec Conference, all the aides, all the staff, all the note takers, everyone is told to leave. And there are no records of what was said uh, during those meetings. Compromise did come out. But at the end of one of those sessions, uh, Lord Mountbatten, the head of combined op operations, has something he wants to show the combined chiefs of staff. Pycrete. It is a, a combination of sawdust and frozen water. Um, it is shatterproof. Um, uh, it floats. And there's this bizarre idea of making floating aircraft carriers uh, out, of, out of it. And Mountbatten, who 
I was not, I would say, the brightest bulb on, in the planet. Mountbatten decides to show that it's shatterproof by firing a pistol into the block of picrete. Well, what happens if you fire a bullet into something that is shatterproof? It ricochets. <laughs> and it almost killed Admiral King, the ricochets. Everyone ducked for cover. And when they were finished with the experiment, picrete was secret. So they put the block on a gurney, put a cover over it, and wheeled it outside, at which point one of the guards turned to another guard and said, I knew it. Sooner or later, these guys were going to start shooting each other. <laughs> they didn't, but uh, the, the arguments were intense, and you can't get that simply by reading the official minutes. <coughs> you have got to read the memoirs of those who were there to understand just how hot it got. And think of how difficult it is for two nations with different histories, with different goals in the war, with different strategies to somehow compromise. As Churchill put it, the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without them. They knew what they had to do, and they succeeded in doing it. But I love the Pie Creek story too. <laughs> Okay, well, let's, uh, let's stop now. Mark, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. Listen, I, 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 <clears throat> I, I actually have a story on Mark. He got out here, and you know, we're having this little bout of cold weather. He's from Vermont. Vermont got eight inches of snow, so he avoided snow by coming to Minnesota. <laughs> I, that, yes, I can boast that for the rest of my life. <laughs> I avoided a blizzard in Vermont by coming to Minnesota in the winter. I love Thank that. you. You've done a marvelous job. Thank you. This is a great audience, isn't it? It's a wonderful audience. Thank all of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your excellent questions. And I hope I kept you awake. <laughs> Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.